Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. Thanks so much for tuning in. My name is Dana Tribbiana and I cover infamous gangsters every week in a true crime-like format. My show, Mob Times, comes out every Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. Most times. Well, it's Tuesday, it's 10 a.m., so here I am. If you're new here, welcome. If you've been here before, I hope you already know how much I love and appreciate all your love and support, and thanks so much for coming back every week. So I've been trying to start off these videos with a little personal story about myself before just jumping into every week's gangster because honestly, I've noticed that since I started doing that, my average watch time has like skyrocketed. So it looks like a lot of people are interested in my boring stories about my life. So I'm going to go ahead and keep giving them to you. If you're not interested in my story and you just want to hear about this week's gangsters, I do put chapters into the descriptions of my videos. So you can go ahead and just click to the beginning of this week's gangster in the video chapters and it'll skip my whole story time and bring you right to the beginning of the story about the gangster. So that's always an option. You don't have to listen to me blabber. So big news, everybody. I finally got a date for the embryo transfer. It's going to be on March 30th, which is like next week. I'll say again, I only say a lot of the stuff that I say on here because I know that basically nobody that I know in real life watches these videos. So if you are someone that knows me in real life and you happen to be in this video, shut up and don't spread it around, okay? I don't want to tell everybody that I know. But yeah, that's exciting for me. And it's funny because my sister-in-law, her birthday is January 30th. And if I have the embryo transfer on March 30th, my due date would be January 29th. She had a baby and she had a baby on my birthday. And I was really upset about it because now I can't ever celebrate my birthday with his family again because it's the kid, you know? I'm joking. I'm not really upset. It was cool. But now I'm like, haha, I'm going to pay you back, bitch. Like, get ready to have a baby with your birthday because that is not your birthday anymore. That is my kid's birthday, just like you did to me. I really like my sister-in-law. I get along really well with her. So there's no, you know, bad blood or anything. It's it's a funny joke. So yeah, other than that, um, I had my first iron infusion last week and I had Botox for my migraines. No, it's not so that I keep like looking pretty. I get them in my skull, my neck and my shoulders for the migraines that I get from an injury. So after the iron infusion and the Botox, I have been getting these wild headaches. Like I'm talking cannot open my eyes if there's a light on. My eyes feel like there's daggers being jabbed in them. I usually get headaches for about a week after my Botox injections and I get them every three months so I'm pretty used to it but hopefully I've gotten through the worst of it now because like even right now I have a headache and it just sucks. If you have migraines you know the absolute horror of getting them and then you talk about like a cluster of them. It sucks. I've been looking for ways to further my platform because like while I've seen a pretty huge explosion in following, I've gained like a thousand followers since February, which is amazing. It just still feels so slow. And like I'll put a video up and it'll get like three to four hundred views. And that causes soul death in me because I put so much work into each one of these videos. So my typical one to two thousand views isn't much, but it at least makes me feel like it was like somewhat worth it. It was worth all the work that I put in that some people saw it. It had somewhat of an impact. So going down that route, I've been looking at media outlets and stuff to help with like promoting my channel, my videos, stuff like that. And I was looking on one site, but then I found a girl doing reviews of that site and she tore it up. So I'm glad I found her site before I moved forward because that shit was like, I don't know, it's somewhere between two and four hundred dollars. It was a lot. And they legit do nothing. So we're right back where we started. I also applied to be a speaker at CrimeCon. I don't know if you know, but there's like a convention going on in Florida in September and it's like wholly involving true crime. It definitely seems like it's way more your like typical true crime stuff, talking about like serial killers and specific cases and stuff. But I did apply and even if they don't want me to speak, which more than likely I'm going to get denied. So more than likely I'm not going to be a speaker there. But even if I get declined, I'll definitely still be attending. 
because I love all things true crime, which is obviously why I do this. Like, yeah, I discuss mobsters and gangsters rather than, like, your run-of-the-mill true crime girly discusses, but I do it in the format that they do it because I absolutely love true crime. When I'm not working on my own channel, I'm usually listening to somebody else's podcast or videos or whatever about true crime. So it would be amazing to be able to talk there, but I'm super psyched to go in general. Not only because it's a huge opportunity to share my channel, obviously, but but because I would like to see more women getting interested in the kind of videos that I do. When I first started my videos, my audience was like literally 90% men, 10% women. There was no females that had any interest in me whatsoever. It's a little more spread out now. I would say about 70-30 now. But women are missing out. And they see the name of a mobster and they're like, Ugh, I'm not interested. And they move on and they're missing out because they think that they have no interest in the mafia. But what I do is no different than what the girls do when they're like putting makeup on in their videos while discussing serial killers. I'm just like a botard and I can't do makeup at all in general, no less do makeup while I'm making a video like that will absolutely never happen. The point is, I would love to see more women have their eyes open to my channel and join my community because as much as I love my boys, you guys know I love you. But women are where it's at. Like, they're the ones that are going to be so supportive of each other. They're going to be the ride or die ones. They're behind you 120%. They're helping you share your channel. Like, women are incredible when it comes to supporters. So yeah, if you're going to be at CrimeCon, I hope I get a chance to meet you. Maybe I, I might dress up as a mobster. That would be kind of cool. People dress up when they go to Comic-Con as like comic people. I don't know why I couldn't dress up as a gangster. I could get down with dressing as like Lucky Luciano or Al Capone or something. I think that would be fun. Okay, so I have rambled enough. Let's go ahead and get into this week's gangster, shall we? in the early 1900s was a really tough place to grow up, especially for the children of immigrants who struggled to make ends meet. One of those children was Benjamin Ruggiero, known as Lefty to his friends. Lefty Ruggiero was born on April 19, 1926 in Hell's Kitchen, Manhattan. His father, Fiore Ruggiero, and his mother, Fanny, were Italian immigrants. Sorry I look a little different. I just was sitting here and I got a little itchy and then all of a sudden I was covered from like here to like here in hives. If you're listening, the tip of my hairline all the way down to like my sternum was just covered in, it looked like mosquito bites, but it was brutal. Closest I've come in a very long time to having to use my EpiPen, but I didn't, thank God. I just put some Benadryl cream on and the Benadryl cream kind of messed everything up. So I had to completely redo my face and my hair, but I got this far with my face and my hair. So there's no way I was just doing it tomorrow. So here we are. So anyways, his father, Fiore Ruggiero, and his mother, Fanny, were Italian immigrants. And I looked really hard, and I can't find what part of Italy they come from. It's really weird. You can usually find that kind of stuff on any mafia, guys. But if anybody knows the answer to that, I'd appreciate me being let know because I can't find it anywhere. I even read that stupid little useless book that's for sale on Kindle, by the way. It's only 99 cents. You think like, oh yeah, it's a steal. Don't do it. It's legit very little more than the Wikipedia. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your money. There's nothing in it. It's stupid. Watch this video. You'll get more about him than you will in that book. So they came to America and they settled in the area that they would raise their kids in. 
the fourth ward in the Knickerbocker Village Housing Development in Little Italy on Monroe Street. All of that's in Manhattan, obviously. After Ruggiero was born, his parents had two more children. He had a younger brother named Dominic and a younger sister named Angelina. So we have got an oldest sibling here, and it shows... As an only child, I kind of like to look into the dynamics of, like, oldest sibling, middle sibling, youngest sibling, only child syndrome, and it makes sense a lot of the time. Ruggiero is somebody that sticks to the rules. He's a mafia guy. He is very respectful of mafia law. He is a gangster's gangster, and that's exactly what you would expect to see from an oldest child, a rule follower. Despite the hardships of growing up in poverty, Lefty's parents actually did a very good job with working on him morally. They instilled in him and his siblings a very strong work ethic and a sense of discipline. So these weren't wild kids just running the neighborhood. His parents cared. His father, Fiore Ruggiero, was a truck driver who would work a lot of hours, like a lot of hours, to provide for the family. His mother, Fanny, was a homemaker, and she was, you know, your quintessential Italian stay-at-home mom. Lefty took the sense of hard work and dedication to heart, and he lived by that his whole life. But at the same time, he was a troublemaker. He would get into a lot of fights with other kids, and just pretty much, if he wanted to cause mischief, he was gonna. He dropped out of school at a really young age, and he started working these odd jobs, and he kind of presented it as, oh, well, I'm working to try to help take care of the family, pay some bills, because even though his father worked all these hours and was never home, they were still very, very much so struggling. He worked as a delivery boy, a shoeshine boy, and a soda jerk. Lefty was a very bright and curious child. He loved to read and loved learning about history and current events. So he was someone that really cared about reading the newspaper. He was a talented athlete, and he played baseball and basketball in his free time. Despite the trouble that he got into here and there, his family was really, really important to him. And he did everything that he could to support them. So when he said, hey, I'm dropping out of school and I want to help take care of the family, it was actually true. Despite the good morals that his parents had ingrained in him, he still was in a neighborhood that was known to be a very tough place. Little Italy was very well known for organized crime, and he was exposed to violence and crime a lot. As he got older, he started hanging out with the wrong crowd, and he got involved in petty theft and vandalism. It didn't take long before the local mafia guys started paying attention to him. They saw potential in him. He was this young and ambitious kid that grew up in the neighborhood. They knew his parents. They knew that they had immigrated from Italy, so he was straight Italian. And this is exactly the kind of person that the mafia is looking for. Somebody who they watched grow up. And they know for a fact that his interests align with theirs. If you look at it as a summary, his childhood was pretty much a mix of poverty, education, and exposure to criminal activities. All of this would shape him into the ruthless and cunning member of the mafia that he would become later. As a young man, Ruggiero joined the Bonanno crime family, and he was a street soldier under the capo Michael Sabella. Initially, when he got into the Bonanno family, started working under Sabella, he was an enforcer. He's carrying out acts of violence on behalf of the family. If they need somebody to go and rough up a store owner that's not up to date on his payments, Lefty's the one they're sending. If they need a gambling debt to be collected, he's gonna go break some kneecaps. So pretty much he's the one going out there and in any sorts of violence that needs to be doled out. Ruggiero quickly rose to prominence in bookmaking, extortion, and loan sharking. He was six feet tall, which is very, very tall for an Italian. Like, a lot of Italian men are short. It's just, it is what it is. And on top of that, he was lean. He had a very skinny stature and a narrow face, and he had a very distinctive look. He had very intense eyes, 
He walked around with bad posture. He had stooped shoulders, and his voice was very raspy. Picture somebody that had been smoking since they were nine. He loved to smoke English ovals cigarettes, and it showed. Ruggiero's brother, Dominic, changed his last name to Ruggiero in order to avoid being lumped in with the rest of the family because he came to be known as a mafia member. He had a bad reputation, and Dominic didn't want to be known as the brother of Lefty Ruggiero. So he changed his name to Regero. He got an apartment with his fellow mafia soldier, which it was a really good friend of his, Anthony Mira, and they got an apartment on Monroe Street in Manhattan. So he grew up on Monroe Street. He lived on Monroe Street with his friend. He wasn't leaving that area. I'm willing to bet their headquarters was somewhere in the vicinity. And it was even said that Ruggiero kept a cigarette boat on the East River in New York which is pretty cool. Imagine like, oh, I don't feel like waiting in traffic. Let's just go hop in the boat I have. Philip Rusty Rustali, the future head of the family, and Mira became really close friends with Ruggiero, and they just became like a threesome. This little pack that they had, it was a really tight circle, and they just really got along together. Before we go any further, I want to stop here and fully explain who Donnie Brasco is. Donnie Brasco was a fictional character, and he was created by the FBI so that Agent Joe Pistone could go deep undercover and infiltrate the mafia. Pistone spent the first six months of his assignment in the Colombo family working with Anthony Mira. So Anthony Mira is the one that's living with Lefty, and Joe Pistone, who is going by Donnie Brasco, is working with Anthony Mira. Mira, who is a member of the Colombo family at the time, is just kind of an associate of Brasco's. Brasco's cover was that he was a jewel thief, a savant in jewels. He was amazing at stealing them, selling them, appraising them, everything. Pistone's initial assignment was to infiltrate truck hijacking and fence any stolen rings or jewelry that the family had. The assignment was initially supposed to only last around six months. So six months after he started working with Mira, when Mira was arrested and sent to jail, he was supposed to just go back to his everyday FBI life. Mira was arrested for drug trafficking, and he was given an eight-year sentence. It didn't end up happening that Pistone just went back to FBI life because he ended up catching the eye of Lefty. And when Lefty took him under his wing and started introducing him to everybody in the family, there was a gold mine of information that the FBI was able to get. So the FBI was like, oh, hell yeah, stay where you are, bro. We'll continue paying you. You go out there, you be a gangster, and you just collect all the data. Bring me all the information. And they loved it. It's funny because when Anthony Miro got out of jail, he tried to reclaim Brasco. He said that Brasco belonged to him, not Ruggiero. And he even brought this issue all the way up to the commission. Like, he was pissed. The commission ruled in Ruggiero's favor, and you'll see why this is funny later on. Brasco really wanted nothing to do with Mira. He claimed that Mira was the nastiest and most intimidating man that he met during his entire seven years undercover. So he really did not like Mira. So when the thought of going back to Mira instead of Ruggiero, who was a lot more like accommodating and friendly and just a lot easier to hang around with, he was like, oh, hell no. And he fought against it in front of the commission. So he ended up being able to stay with Ruggiero. I'm going to go over everything, everything that played out with Brasco, but I will tell you this. It's pretty obvious that Brasco came to admire and actually really like Lefty. In my own opinion, this isn't like said anywhere, it's just in my own opinion, not really much of what Brasco said can really be trusted so much because it's pretty obvious that he really likes Lefty. And if the FBI didn't do what they did, I could totally see Brasco leaving the FBI and just going full send into the mafia. That didn't end up happening, obviously, but I needed to lay the groundwork for who this guy is because I'm willing to bet that at least 90% of the people that are watching this video right now did not see the movie Donnie Brasco. If you ever get a chance, the movie is 
amazing. Definitely check it out. But if you didn't see it, it's fine. We're going to go through it here. And that's why I just I had to stop and say, okay, this is who this is. Because Donnie Brasco is definitely what Lefty Ruggiero is most well known for. Ruggiero became a co-owner of a fishery in Manhattan's Fulton Fish Market. As a co-owner, he was able to put himself on the company payroll, and he was able to write himself pretty much a blank check. Like, he could do whatever he wanted, make as much as he wanted, and he ended up providing himself with a salary of $5,000 a month. And this is pretty much a no-show job. Figure, this is somewhere in the 1960s, which means that $5,000 a month that he's making would be equivalent to around $51,000 now that he's just raking in and doesn't even have to show up for work. This man has it made. In the 70s, he bought a social club in Little Italy, and that's not hard to figure out where he came up with the money for it. Ruggiero was given a pet lion, so he actually was that guy and had a lion. In the movie, you can see Lefty being given a lion. Brasco says that they fed the lion about 20 to 30 steaks a day, and Lefty would walk the lion up and down the streets of Manhattan. In the movie, the lion was, like, grown. It was a big-ass lion. That's not how it was. It was given to him as a cub, and he ended up having to give it away when it got too big. When he gave it away, he brought the lion to a park, he tied it to a tree, and then called the cops so that the cops would come retrieve him. But imagine being a passerby in the park that day. Like, just, like, leisurely walking down the grass, and you got your little shit dog that's this big, and all of a sudden you look over, and there is a grown-ass lion tied to a freaking tree in Manhattan. Like, Dead. Right there. Dead. Goodbye. No longer living. He was known throughout the mafia as somebody who really loved animals. So Sonny Black, who's another character that we're going to go over soon, got him the lion as a gift. So that will tell you about his reputation and how he's known for having an absolute obsession with animals. Ruggiero rose and became a made man in the late 1970s, which is just I know I've gone over it a million times on here, but becoming a made man, it just means that you're untouchable. Nobody can touch you. If somebody so much as lays a hand on you, it is a death sentence for them. Being a made man is just a very powerful and important role. So to become that, it's important. It matters. He's a made man. He's a very important man. And pretty much what it means is just a fully initiated member of the mafia. So he was a made man in the Bonanno family. All in all, Brasco spent six years with the family, and he gained their trust. He spent the entire time gathering evidence and giving everything that he had back to the FBI, but he spent six years there. I feel like no matter what, even if this is like the worst person ever that you're dealing with, you're gonna grow a relationship. You're gonna start to like them. Even if you're an FBI agent, it doesn't matter. It makes sense why Brasco started to like him so much. Imagine spending every day of your life with somebody for six years. You're gonna come to like them. You just are. Brasco started working under Ruggiero, helping him place bets and collect any money that needed to be collected for the bookmaking operation or in his social club. So they just like hung out at the social club. They collected debts. They, you know, did the whole bookmaking thing. He just was teaching him the ropes. Ruggiero mentored Brasco. And eventually, he even promised that he would sponsor him to become a fully made member. Lefty saw Brasco as a protege. He believed in him. He believed in his future. He fully, fully, fully had no doubts about this man. And would you? If you spent every day of your life for six years with somebody, would you have any doubts about them? No, you wouldn't. But all the while, Brasco is just sitting here gathering intelligence. He's wearing wires. Every single important thing that happens, he has like a handler, and he's going back and reporting everything back. The information that he gained would eventually lead to the arrest and conviction of dozens of mafia members, including Lefty. Brasco was Ruggiero's best man at his wedding in 1977, and he frequently talked to him and helped him to deal with his son's heroin addiction. 
So this is real personal shit. This is not, oh, you're my coworker. This is like, you're my best friend in the entire world type shit. You're my best man. I'm talking to you about my drug addict son. Like, these guys are best friends. Ruggiero and his first wife, who, try as I might, I cannot find this girl's first name. I can't. But he and his first wife had three daughters and one son together. Her last name was Spano, and all the kids kept her last name. So her son was Tommy Spano. He got a divorce with his first wife in the late 1950s, and it didn't take long before he was remarried and living with his second wife, Louise. It was an easy transition because he had been sleeping with her the entire time he was married to his first wife. Ruggiero married Louise in a small ceremony at New York City Hall in September of 1977. Thomas Spano, Ruggiero's son with his first wife, struggled really badly with a heroin addiction. He was a member of the Bonanno family. He had followed his father into the family. And he was doing all kinds of crazy shit because you're a mafia member whose dad is a made man and you're a heroin addict. Like, obviously, shit is not going well here. He ended up checking into a drug rehabilitation center in 1979, and he did get clean. That was the last time he did drugs. This was really hard on Lefty. But Donnie was there to help him through it and just regularly was there to counsel him like, hey, this is what you should do. Like, don't be too hard on him. Go and, you know, don't be mean to him when you go and visit him and just like told him what to do, how to handle things, calmed him down, let him vent, just best friendship. Ruggiero's younger daughter worked at a hospital in New York and she also ran a booth at San Gennaro's Feast in Little Italy. At this little booth that she had, she sold fruits and sodas. So she was involved in the neighborhood. Like, if you have a booth at the festival, you're a well-known member of society. She is ingrained in the fabric of this neighborhood. She lived with her mom, and they lived in the same building that Lefty lived in with his new wife. So even though they got divorced, they never really went too far from each other, and I'm assuming the relationship was amicable if they wanted to live in the same building. I'm willing to bet that even when he was married to his second wife, he was still banging wife number one. Because he was banging wife number two while he was married to wife number one, and then wife number one stays in the building? Like, come on. He's definitely banging that chick. But it's a pretty good setup. You know, you got one wife on one floor and one wife on the next. You got kids with both of them. Like, cool. Go you, man. Who else? Joe Gallo had the same thing, if I'm not mistaken. I don't want to look it up. It's not really that important. But I'm pretty sure that Joey Gallo had two girls living in the same building and he was banging the both of them. One was in a penthouse. One was like lower on the floor. And I'm pretty sure the girl that he was banging was the one that was in the penthouse. And his wife was like on the sixth floor or something. I feel like I'm gossiping (laughs) with you guys. Like, oh my God, do you remember hearing that? So excuse me and my gossiping ways. I know it's a sin. Two of Ruggiero's daughters married mobsters. And that makes sense. I mean, you grow up in the life. You see it all around you. All the people you meet are in the mafia because your dad is bringing all his friends around. It's a lifestyle that they're comfortable with. They grew up around it. So it makes sense why they would do that. And you know what? Lefty is really proud of the mafia and he really loves it. Like a lot of the time you see guys saying like, oh, I'll never let my kid get into this. But Lefty brought his son into the Bonanno family. So it makes sense that he would allow his daughters to marry other mobsters because if he's letting his son come into it, it's showing like he loves the mafia. This is his whole life. So he's totally fine. There's no, oh, I want better for my kids. I don't want my kids out there murdering and going to jail and blah, blah. No, this is the life and just is what it is. One of his daughters married a man named Marco. Marco was a well-known, obnoxious kid, but he was dope as hell at safe cracking. He was very Gotti-esque. He earned all of this money illegally, but he had no problem spending it out in the open. 
He lived lavishly. He had the nicest boats and the nicest cars and went on the nicest vacations. And Lefty had no problem with this because he's bringing his daughter on these nice vacations. He has his daughter living in the nice house sailing on the nice boat, so Lefty doesn't have an issue. What went down with his son-in-law Marco has been cause for speculation for all of time. According to public reports, the Bonanno family learned that Marco was defrauding them. Apparently, he was embezzling money, he wasn't handing up as much as he was supposed to of his profits, whatever, he's stealing from them. According to public reports, Lefty was ordered to kill his son-in-law, and he did. That was the talk of the town. That's what the police believed. That's what the public was told. But there was never any proof to back it up, so he walked away from it. According to Donnie Brasco, or by the time this came out, Joseph Pistone, in his book, Donnie Brasco, My Undercover Life in the Mafia, what actually happened is that Marco had staged a heist. And in a turn of bad luck, the dude that he set up the heist against was actually another made man, and he didn't realize it until afterwards. When Lefty found out about this, he freaked out and even borrowed money from Brasco to try to pay the higher-ups to not have him hit. Like, he was like, here, take money, I'll cover his debts, I'll do whatever I have to do to keep him alive, this is my daughter's husband, this is my son-in-law, please don't kill him. This is according to Donnie Brasco. Regardless of the events that led up to it, it didn't work. Marco vanished and his corpse was never found. Ruggiero was referred to as Lefty Two Guns or Lefty Guns. The term Two Guns was used because whenever he shot somebody, he would come at them with a gun in each hand. Two hands, two guns. The nickname Lefty came from the fact that he only used his left hand to throw dice. Ruggiero committed numerous crimes as a soldado for the Bonanno family, including bookmaking, extortion, loan sharking, and a lot of murder. Ruggiero is accused of murdering about 26 people during his lifetime, but most people think it was way more than that. More than likely, it was probably more than 30. So let me set the scene for you now. It's the late 1970s. Ruggiero and Brasco are on vacation. They're in Miami Beach. They're enjoying a nice meal at a restaurant. It's an outdoor restaurant. The weather's beautiful. They're just loving life right now. Ruggiero is flipping through a copy of Time magazine when all of a sudden he comes across an article about the infamous Abscam scandal. The article detailed how FBI agents had posed as wealthy Arab businessmen to catch U.S. congressmen taking bribes. So this article is literally talking about FBI agents infiltrating organizations and taking people down, which is exactly what Donnie Brasco is doing. So now he's sweating bullets. As Ruggiero is reading through this article, all of a sudden, a picture catches his eye. He comes across a picture of a white yacht that the FBI had used to entertain the congressman. The yacht's name was The Left Hand, and Ruggiero recognized it immediately. The left hand was the same boat that Brasco had provided several months earlier for a party. And this sends red flags flying in Lefty's head. He's flipping out. He's like, the left hand? My name is Lefty. You think I misremembered it? I'm 100% sure this is that boat. Like, do you think I'm stupid? And he's freaking out. He's like, why would the FBI use this boat that you provided for me? What does that mean? What, what is that? Are you, are you FBI? And he's bugging. He turns around to Brasco and he's like, hey, you want to fucking explain yourself, please? I'd appreciate it. Brasco, though, he's quick on his feet. He's been at this a while and he comes up with an explanation. He says that he had borrowed the boat from a friend and he had no idea that the owner was related to the FBI. Ruggiero, he tentatively accepted this explanation. He didn't turn around and kill him, but his flags were raised. His spidey senses are tingling right now. But this incident was a really close call. Brasco knew that if Ruggiero had connected the dots, 
his cover would have been blown and more than likely, Lefty would have turned around and shot him in the head. Like, he would not have made it out of that encounter if he didn't believe him. Again, I say, Ruggiero has 30 bodies under him. Do you think it's going to matter that he's his friend if he thinks he's a cop? No, it's not. This incident just showed how close Brasco was to being exposed and how important it was for him to maintain his cover because he knew his life was immediately forfeit if his cover was ever blown. It also was a huge eye-opening incident for Brasco as well because he wouldn't expect Ruggiero to connect those dots. This man's supposed to be a stone-cold killer. He's supposed to just have murder on his mind. It's not supposed to be this, like, really smart, intuitive dude. And when he figured that out, when he looked and he was like, hey, wait a minute, one plus two is not equal in three here. What the fuck? The math ain't math. And it was kind of like, wow, like, I underestimated this dude. He is really smart. At some point earlier in his life, before he met Donnie Brasco, Lefty met Frank Balistrieri, who was a very well-known mafia boss and figure in the Bonanno family. Balistrieri was a powerful and respected boss, and he saw potential in Lefty. But Lefty did go back to Brasco and tell him, like, I am a little threatened by dude. Like, he has me on the edge of my seat. I'm not extremely comfortable with him. I'm guessing the conversation was like, oh yeah, like he scares the fuck out of me. Something along those lines. But he just, he somehow got it across like, this dude makes me uncomfortable. I am nervous around him. But despite his reservations, he would go on and work with him on a lot of different crimes criminal activities. In 1979, Lefty decided to convert his social club into a candy store, and he just gave it to one of his daughters to manage, which is pretty dope. Like, oh, here's a store. It's all yours. They don't say it, but you know what? I bet you it's the daughter that was married to Marco because like, okay, I'm sorry your husband died. Here's a candy store. Like that. (laughs) That's a little messed up, but I'll bet you that was the one. Either way, though, it was a really smart move on his part. It was the legitimate business that he could claim that his money was coming from. This candy store cleaned all of his money, so he would bring in illegal money and just say that it was being made by the candy store. Out of that store, Lefty and Brasco started a bookmaking operation. Bookmaking, which is also known as people who are bookies, is just when people take bets on sporting events and any other activity. So any kind of betting is bookmaking. This was a really profitable business for both Lefty and Brasco, and it allowed them to make a lot of money really quickly. Lefty, unfortunately, had to drop the partnership kind of soon though, because he wasn't able to provide the initial required investment of $25,000. See, Lefty had a little bit of a gambling problem. I say little bit, but this man was a degenerate gambler. His inability to come up with the money was a really significant setback for him, and it made him realize that he wasn't as respected in the mafia as he thought he was. Like, it made him do a lot of self reflecting. Like, maybe I'm not as loved and popular as I thought that I was. The experience was a pretty big turning point for Lefty, and it made him paranoid and pretty suspicious of the people that were around him. He became a lot more cautious and guarded, and he would even start to distance himself from Balistrieri and a lot of other high-ranking mafia members. Despite the setback, though, he would continue to operate his criminal enterprise, and he always remained a respected member of the Bonanno family. He would go on to play a significant role in various criminal activities, including drug trafficking and extortion. For Ruggiero, being a wise guy, a gangster, a mobster, it was more than just a job. It was literally his life. La Cosa Nostra was Ruggiero's life. 
He took that oath seriously. When they say this has to matter more than your kids, more than your wife, if your son is dying and we call you because we need you, you leave your son's deathbed. And he believed in that shit. He would have left his dying son's deathbed to be there for La Cosa Nostra. Not only did he have a respect for the life, but he loved the power and the respect that came with being in the mafia. Like, if you're a connected guy, you get a lot of respect. You get handed things. You go through the back doors to the clubs. You don't wait on lines. You are given things. Like, the community loves you. You're just a very well-respected person, and he loved that. One time, he said to Brasco, As a wise guy, you can lie, you can cheat, you can steal, you can finagle, you can cause a ruckus, you can do anything, and nobody can say a word about it. Who wouldn't want to be a wise guy? Ruggiero's reputation as a killer was well known among other mobsters. But on a daily basis, he wasn't a violent guy. He wasn't angry. He wasn't the type to just like hairpin trigger, lose his mind. He was a normal dude. He just killed people when he had to. He's like that serial killer that it's like, oh my god, I never would have suspected it. He's such a nice guy. That's Ruggiero. He was a smooth talker and a master negotiator. He always, always, always found a way to get what he wanted. And he very rarely had to resort to force or violence. He was the kind of person that was just friends with everybody. Everybody respected him. Everybody was friendly with him. He asked you about your mother. He was that guy that just a lot of people liked being around. One of the really big things, like one of the highlights of Ruggiero's career, is that he got really far in the mafia and never served time in prison. He had been arrested a bunch of times, but he always, always got out of jail. He never served time in jail. And his always getting out of it and never having to do any jail time, that's a testament to how well he can navigate the legal system and his willingness to do anything it took to stay out of jail. Like, this man was going to die for the chance to remain free. He was very well respected by his fellow mobsters, and he was very feared by his enemies. Like, people that talked about him on the street, it was like, oh yeah, that guy's such a cool guy. Don't fuck with him. Don't get on his bad side. But he is such a cool guy. Like, I love kicking it with him. I love chilling with him. Super awesome dude but don't fuck with him. He also had a reputation for being a tough negotiator and a shrewd businessman. And everybody knew how loyal he was to the Bonanno family. Everybody knew what a gangster he was, how devoted he was to La Cosa Nostra. And they respected that. A lot of guys envied that because everybody in the mafia wants to be like that. Everybody wants their entire life to be La Cosa Nostra. Like, they want to love it as much as he clearly does. But a lot of people don't. You know, they have their own lives. They're selfish. They have self-interests. And La Cosa Nostra isn't the most important thing to them, but they want it to be. And that was something that made Ruggiero an idol to a lot of his fellow mafia members. By the 1970s, Lefty had become a significant player in the Bonanno crime family. He was involved in various illegal activities. He got in on everything. I'm talking drug trafficking, extortion, racketeering, bookmaking, everything you could think of in the gangster's handbook, Lefty had his hand in. The only problem is he has this secret that's taking over his life. He is a degenerate gambler, and he can't get it under control. He had a soft spot for betting on horse races, and he dumped everything he had into the horses. He would spend entire days at the tracks just betting and betting and betting. And unfortunately, he wasn't very lucky. He started to lose a significant amount of money. So no matter how much money he was raking in, it was just all going right back out to the horse races. 
To cover his losses, he turned to Nicholas Marangello, a fellow member of the Bonanno family, and he borrowed money from him. As his debt started to accrue and just pile on top of each other, before he knew it, it was 1977, and he owed Marangello $160,000, all from gambling. That would be only slightly under $800,000 today. So picture being in debt $800,000 to a mafia member. The Bonanno family had a strict policy that anybody that wanted to become a made man had to be debt free. It's like buying a house. You cannot buy a house if you have any debt whatsoever. Like you have any collections or anything, it all has to be squared away before you can buy a house. Same thing with becoming a made man. He did manage to pay off his full debt by 1977, and then in 1977, that's when he was officially inducted as a made man. But he was $160,000 in debt, like Jesus Christ. So he pulls off this amazing feat and pays off all the money that he owes. He pays off $160,000 to Marangello. And by 1978, he was right back in debt to him. Because of how far in the hole he was going, the family intervened. And they pretty much put him on child support. They arranged for the revenues from anything that Lefty did to be transferred directly to Marangello to settle the debt. Because, like, he just kept going to the horse races instead of paying him back. And they're like, oh, yeah? Okay, cool. Watch you not make money and everything you do is going to go to pay off this debt. So what is a degenerate gambler to do when he has no income because it's all being diverted to pay off debt? Well, of course, he starts to make and hide assets. He would try to keep different money in different accounts, and he would make investments and just do everything he could to keep the money that he made away from the Bonanno family because they're just going to take every dime of it. And the crazy part is, is that even though he's doing all this shisty shit, even though he's just, his life is falling apart over this gambling addiction, he's still a trusted associate to the boss. He still is full send on the Bonanno family. Like, he still is an exemplary member of the mafia. In 1979, the Bonanno crime family boss, or so he called himself boss, Carmine Galante was murdered, and that created a power vacuum in the organization. Carmine Galante wasn't actually the boss. So I guess he was like the acting boss, but Rastali was always the actual boss, but Rastali was in jail. If you're interested to know the dynamics of that, I do have a full video on Carmine Galante. I'll link it below, but he never was officially made the boss. Like, he was never given the okay to be boss by the commission. Philip Rastali took his position back as boss. He never gave it up, but I guess to everybody looking from the outside in that he had taken it back, but he had always been the recognized leader of the family. After Galante's murder, factions started to pop up and this power vacuum started. A faction led by Alphonse Sunny Red in Delicato decided that they were going to rebel against Rastali. They didn't want Rastali to have control. And they led a split within the Bonanno family. Ruggiero was a really close friend of Dominic Sunny Black. Napolitano. And Napolitano is a very strong supporter of Rastali. So because Ruggiero is so close with Napolitano, and he's also pretty good friends with Rastali, so Ruggiero is fully behind Rastali. He has got his back. Ruggiero is known for his loyalty, and he's a really valuable member of Napolitano's crew. On May 5th, 1981, Indelicato and two other rebel capos, Philip Giacone and Dominic Trinchera, were lured to a meeting under the pretense of discussing a peace agreement. But it was a trap. The three men were murdered, and their bodies were found in a remote location in upstate New York. And these guys, they were taken apart like Roy DeMeo style. This dude was not playing. I actually discussed this entire murder on a prior episode, my video about Rizzuto. 
One of the killers in this whole mess was Vito Rizzuto, son of Nicolo Rizzuto, and they were requested to come down from Canada to pull off this hit so as to, like, try to put distance between the leadership of the family and this killing, because either way, this is members of your own family that you're often. And they can't have that known. Like, you cannot kill people within your own family. So they contracted the hit to the Rizzuto family. Vito Rizzuto was super amped to get this request. Like, they're in Canada. They are the Bananas, but like a faction of the Bananas. And Vito Rizzuto wants nothing more than to show his undying loyalty to the New York Bonanno family. So he is there. They request it, and he is there. This slaughter would later come to be known as the latter-day version of Al Capone's St. Valentine's Day Massacre because of how many people were killed and how brutal it was. Like, they found legs, okay? This was serious. Ruggiero didn't take part in this hit. He was a lookout, and he was called in afterwards to dispose of the body, so he was the one that, like, Roy DeMeo-style cut them up, but he didn't take part in the actual killing of these guys, supposedly. Honestly, this is another situation in where I think that Donnie Brasco got really deep into his role, and the lines blurred on cop and gangster. So, to be 100% honest, I really don't believe half the shit that he says. Because I feel like he would 100% lie to cover up for or protect Lefty. Like, that is fully something I believe he would do. Ruggiero's involvement in these murders, even though he didn't, like, shoot anybody, he was a lookout, he came in and cleaned up the scene, he made sure everything was taken care of, the pieces were not linked to them, like, he helped. And that cemented his position in the Bonanno crime family. He became one of Napolitano's most trusted associates. Napolitano, who had orchestrated the hit, was eventually caught and murdered by his family for the betrayal of killing these three powerful capos in the Bonanno family. Lefty, on the other hand, managed to survive the fallout. He wasn't killed for his part in this. He remained a trusted member of the Bonanno family for years to come. And now, it all comes crashing down. On July 26, 1981, the FBI's undercover operation, known as Donnie Brasco, came to an end. For six years, FBI agent Joe Pistone, under the alias of Donnie Brasco, had infiltrated the Bonanno crime family, and Lefty had become his mentor and best friend. On this day, though, FBI agents visited the apartment of Anthony Napolitano, also known as Bruno, on top of the Motion Lounge, a popular hangout for the Bonanno crime family. Agents informed Napolitano of Brasco's true identity, and he was taken into custody. It's pretty telling that the FBI had to go in and seemingly go behind Brasco's back to blow his cover. As I said earlier, I fully believe that if they didn't go in and rat on him, Brasco would have just given up his life in the FBI and gone into full life as a mobster. When the Bonanno leadership learned of Brasco's true identity, they immediately turned their eyes to Lefty because he was the one who had brought him into the family. Lefty was interrogated and tortured by his fellow mobsters, but he refused to believe anything about Brasco. On August 29th, 1981, the FBI intercepted and arrested Lefty Ruggiero. He was charged with various criminal offenses, including drug trafficking, extortion, and conspiracy to commit murder. Conspiracy, not murder. He wasn't charged with murder. He was charged with conspiracy to commit. So, in other words, like, he was the lookout for this triple murder. That's conspiracy. You're in on it, but you didn't actually murder anyone. Lefty absolutely refused to believe that Brasco was an FBI agent. No matter how many FBI agents told him that this was the case, he was convinced that they were just playing mind games on him. Like, the FBI lies. They'll say that someone ratted when they didn't. Like, they're just playing mind games. This is my best friend. You're lying. In November of 1982, Ruggiero, along with Santora, Antonio Tomasulo, and Anthony Fat Tony Rabido, 
were convicted in a six-week jury trial for racketeering conspiracy. Ruggiero received a 15-year prison sentence, and it seemed like his days as a member of the Bonanno family were over. Until trial, like until the very day of trial, Ruggiero absolutely refused to believe that Brasco was an FBI agent. He was convinced that Brasco was a trusted member of their inner circle and would never turn on him. He wouldn't even believe that he was a rat. He's like, you guys are trying to tell me this is an FBI agent. Bullshit. Like, even if you told me, hey, this is a gangster, but he's ratting, I wouldn't believe you. But a FBI agent? Get the fuck out of here. But on the day of trial, Ruggiero's trust in Brasco was obviously now misplaced. And after Brasco testified against him in court, Ruggiero was filled with rage. He vowed to get revenge, saying, I'll get that motherfucker Donnie if it's the last thing I do. After Brasco was outed as an agent, Dominic Sonny Black Napolitano was brutally killed. His remains were so burnt and or decomposed that the only way that they were able to identify that it was him was through his dental records. His hands were cut off because he shook hands with an agent or like he gave the agent a hand. It was like a symbolizing thing. His hands were cut off after he died though. So there's that. He was killed in the basement of another boss's house and it was brutal. It wasn't a quick, clean, two to the back of the head situation. The shooter was having issues with his gun, and when he kept pulling the trigger but it wouldn't go off, Sonny asked them to make it good. So this guy shoots him, but doesn't kill him. And Sonny turned around and asked to make it quick. I'm guessing, like, quicker than it's going. Like, come on, guys, kill me, please, Jesus. I don't need to be shot 15 times. Like, put me out of my misery. Goddamn ineptitude of these mobsters, man. Sonny Black's murder is the one that's actually depicted in the movie as the murder of Lefty. In the movie, Lefty gets a call that he has to go meet up with his boss, and he knows that he's about to go get whacked. He takes all his jewelry off and leaves all his jewelry and his wallet and everything important to him at his home office. That way, his family would have it, and whoever killed him wouldn't just steal it off his body. He walked out of his house knowing that he was going to be killed, and he stood up like a G and took it. Like, he went to his death knowing that he was walking into his death. He didn't run to the feds because he was scared. Like, he knew. He fucked up. He knew what life he had signed on for, and when everything fell down, he went to his death with his head held high. The Bonanno family was going to have Lefty killed. It only made sense. This was the most embarrassing thing to ever happen to any mafia family, ever. And in their eyes, it was Lefty who brought Brasco down upon the family. And this is why I say it was funny that Anthony Mira had, like, fought for Brasco to be his man. Because, like, look at this. They're all dying. Like, (laughs) ooh, you lost. Sucks to suck, man. If the FBI hadn't intercepted and arrested Lefty... They literally picked him up while he was on his way to the meeting where he was going to die. He 100% would be dead. Like, he was on his way to the meeting. He did the same thing. He put all his jewelry down. He left his wallet at home. He was on his way to go get killed. The FBI intercepted and arrested him. Once he was in custody, and don't get me wrong, the family still could have had him killed in jail. But they kind of made like a tentative agreement with him. Like, we won't come after you if you don't talk. You keep your mouth shut and we'll let you do you. And he didn't. He is one of the few mobsters that took Omerta seriously. He never spoke a word to the police. Even though his family had tried to kill him. Even though he was betrayed by everybody that he ever loved. He still shut his mouth and did his time like a gangster is supposed to do. And for that, the Bonanno family never came after him again, and no one ever tried to kill him again. Anthony Mira went into hiding, knowing that he was next after Sonny Black. He knew. His uncle, Alfred Emberato, and two cousins, Richard Cantarella and Joseph D'Amico, were ordered to find and kill him. 
D'Amico was ultimately the one that was able to get him out of hiding. On February 18, 1982, he brought him to a parking garage in Lower Manhattan, and while they sat in Mira's Mercedes talking, D'Amico shot him multiple times at point-blank range in the back of the head. At the end of the day, Lefty Ruggiero was basically a serial killer. What serial killer do you know has 30 bodies under him and never did a day in jail for murder? He puts Dahmer to shame. Dahmer only had 17 kills, and he was convicted for 15 of those 17 and given a 957-year sentence. Lefty got 15 years, and he died peacefully in his own bed. And while we're talking about body count, let's add here. The movie Donnie Brasco has Al Pacino playing this, like, lovable teddy bear of a man. And don't get me wrong, I'm sure he was. Nobody is just, like, pure evil. And he wasn't, like, a weirdo like Dahmer. But there was one thing for sure. This man was a stone-cold killer. This man was a gangster. He followed the rules, he killed when he was told to kill, and he did not give a shit about anybody or anything above La Cosa Nostra. This group of guys, honestly, it could be argued that this group of guys was the last group of guys that were true gangsters that adhered to La Cosa Nostra and the values that their forefathers had believed in. Omerta, loyalty, and respect. Joe Messino eventually ended up being the first boss of one of the five families to turn state's evidence. He testified that Sonny got whacked over a power dispute, not over Donnie Brasco. But let's call a spade a spade and agree that this just is not the case. Why would he cut his hands off over a power dispute? Like, that's just dumb. Like, yeah, I get it, you're getting rid of fingerprints, blah blah blah, but nothing else was done to try to hide his identity. Nothing else. His teeth weren't taken out, like, nothing. It was just his hands. That's a sign he was killed over Donnie Brasco. Anything else is just laughable. So Ruggiero is in jail, and years go by, and his health begins to decline. In April of 1993, he was released from prison after serving almost 11 years. When he was released, though, he was suffering from lung and testicular cancer, and things were not looking good for him. On November 24th, 1994, Ruggiero passed away at home. The downfall of lefty Ruggiero and his associates marked a significant victory for the FBI's fight against organized crime. The Donnie Brasco operation remains one of the most successful undercover operations in FBI history. This turn of events actually led the Bonanno family to being kicked off the commission. The five families were pissed that this happened. It was like legit an embarrassment for the entire organization of La Cosa Nostra. The Bonanno family was really mad that they lost their seat on the commission. A whole war ensued and like blah blah blah, but it did end up working in their favor. So really, the family really should have thanked Lefty. When the Mafia commission trials came up, the Bonanno family wasn't included in that mass indictment, and they were tried separately. The Mafia commission trials took down far less gangsters in the Bonanno family than any other family because they didn't have a seat on the commission, so they weren't included in the mass roundup that everybody else was. They were still included. They still had some members, but nothing like the rest of the families. A lot of times in these stories, I like to talk about the family of the mafia member. The mafia as a whole has a way of being passed down generation to generation. I don't remember the last time I've covered a mobster and haven't been able to tell you about some son, daughter, grandson, granddaughter, niece, nephew, some member of the family that followed their family member into the life. Lefty's son, Thomas Sparrow, had only one son with his wife. When he got out of rehab, he went back into the Bonanno family where everybody else was being killed for Brasco. Tommy was found dead on January 15th, 1984. He and his friend, Joseph Chili, were found in a Lincoln Continental that they had rented. The car was found in a parking garage in Lower Manhattan, and police said that it was believed to have been related to organized crime. Obviously, this was further payback for Brasco. I can't even imagine what Lefty went through sitting in prison knowing that this happened to his son. Like, it's so sad. 
Lefty also has a granddaughter named Ramona Rizzo, and she joined the cast of Mob Wives in 2011. She was a real one. Even though her grandfather wasn't alive anymore, she could have said anything she wanted to. She never spoke a word about his dealings or anything like that. She just said that when she was younger, she didn't know that he was in the life, that she was close with him, and that was that. No secrets were divulged, no shit was talked, nothing. Ramona had her own little mafia scandal, and to be honest, I'm 100% behind her on this one. I think she was 100% in the right. She is still around, so I'm not really going to go through everything that went on with her, but if you're interested, Google is your best friend, Ramona Rizzo from Mob Wives, but I'm not going to be on here talking about someone that is fully still around. So anyway, that's all I have on Benjamin Lefty Ruggiero. Thanks so much for watching and hanging out with me today. Join me next week as I delve into the lives and legacies of some of the most fascinating and infamous gangsters in all of history. Please don't forget to like, share, subscribe, follow, comment, do all the things, and I'll see you next week. Bye!